Welcome to Water and Waste Digest Continuing Commercial Webinar Series. My name is Dennis Martika. I am the publisher of Water and Waste Digest and Vice President of Scranton Gillette Communications Water Group. Today's webinar topic is Pressure Sewer Design and is presented to you by Environment One Corporation. Our expert facilitator today is Walt Ern. Walt is Director of Market Development, U.S. and Canada, for Environment One's sewer system business. Walt is a graduate of Franklin University in Columbus, Ohio, with a B.S. in Electrical Engineering, an acknowledged expert in the field of pressure sewers with 24 years of experience. Walt is also a member of the Water Environment Federation and serves as technical co-chair of the Submersible Wastewater Pump Association. Walt's guest expert presenter today is Steve Wallace. Steve is a world-renowned designer from Australia with over 200 systems designed delivered. He is the technical director of Pressure Source Solutions in Sydney, Australia. I am pleased to introduce our facilitator, Walt Ernt. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us today. Today we'll be speaking on pressure sewer design. I will be uh, starting the presentation with a general overview of what pressure sewer is, looking at the design aspects of that from the standpoint of what the product is in, in your typical station design. Then I'll be passing it off to Steve, who will do, do a deeper dive into the actual design of the system. On this slide, you'll see a typical layout and what you're seeing here is uh, what a pressure sewer is. And by definition, a pressure sewer is a sanitary sewer system that utilizes a network of grinder pumps to transport wastewater through small diameter pipes into a collection system for treatment. This would be a typical design layout here, and you can see the nodes. Each one of those nodes would be a grinder station. The grinder pump is a submersible pump, and it's designed to reduce the wastewater coming from the home into a fine slurry, and then that is uh, pumped into the small diameter pipe. It's an inch and a quarter coming out of the station into the service collection lateral and then into the service main. Pressure sewers are nice to be used in areas where gravity sewers just are not capable of being used. You can see here in this diagram, in this picture, that you've got big equipment and major excavation that is required when you're using gravity sewer. This is an existing community, and you can see the destruction of the area around the homes to put in the large gravity sewer pipes. Also, lift stations are required with gravity that many times can be eliminated with the use of pressure sewer. In comparison, Here's a small diameter pipe being put in, and in this situation, the insulation only required a ditch switch to make a very small, narrow path in which the pressure, the flexible pipe pressure line was put in. And you can see the difference in the, in the uh, amount of environmental impact in comparison to a gravity sewer. Uh, in this area, the wastewater, again, is pumped through the small diameter pipe. This is following the contour of the land. It's a shallow trench. It's just below the frost line and then that's used to take the waste to the treatment plant. As you can imagine, much less cost involved in this insulation. When we talk about pipe sizes, here's a diagram that shows you the typical low pressure pipe size, inch and a quarter coming out of the pump into force mains that are typically maxed out of four inch, sometimes you'll go up to a six inch. And in comparison to gravity, which starts with much larger pipe uh, and requires a lot more labor, a lot more environmental disruption. A little bit of a problem here with the deck, excuse me. Um, the next picture that's going to be coming up is going to show you a typical lake front property. And here you can see in this layout that these homes are right up against the lake, which is very typical in a lake property. In this area, you had septic tanks which had, were failing and the um, waste was going actually into the lake, including the lake. By installing a pressure sewer, as you can see here, all the waste from the home is taken out and it's pumped up the hill. Uh, and this allows you to use pressure sewers in areas that really gravity just wouldn't work. The homes are right on the lake area. Uh, the, the examples of areas that you use this are rocky soil, hilly terrain, shallow bedrock, areas with high water tables, a long flat run of terrain, and areas where there's slow growth or existing infrastructure and roads, which allow you then to use the pressure sewer to move into these areas with less cost. Pressure sewer is a proven technology. 
It was first used in the early 1970s, and today uh, E1 alone provides daily service to millions of users worldwide. So there are millions and millions of users throughout the world that are using pressure sewers today. And pressure sewers as installed, installed correctly, they, just, uh, dim, they have excellent performance, and this is demonstrated if they're put in correctly with high reliability and low or zero maintenance to the station. This next slide will show you a typical residential installation. As you can see here, the only thing that's showing in this uh, backyard is the top of the tank. The grinder pump station is located in the yard or in the basement of each home. Wastewater flows into the station from the home. This is typically a four inch gravity pipe out of the, the house. And the basin is, then contains a grinder pump, level sensors, valves, and discharge piping. The next slide will show you a uh, below ground view of this station. It's a pressure sewer collection line, and you can see that uh, there's the four inch coming out into the station from the home, into it, uh, the station. The pressure sewer collection line then is delivering out through the lateral into the roadway. Pressure sewer collection lines deliver wastewater into the central treatment. Sometimes they'll go into a manhole drop of existing gravity or directly into the force main. The wastewater is then transported thousands of feet into higher levels into the discharge. This slide will show you a cross-sectional view of a typical station. Uh, there is the tank that's buried below the ground. You can see that it has a grinder pump with the level sensors, the piping and valve that come out of the pump that will discharge the ground up waste and the slurry of waste out into the inch and a quarter pipe. Typical basin sides and residential application, 24 inch diameter in various depths depending on the frost line for the geographic area. And then a very small alarm panel is used in conjunction. As you move into larger areas, you will see a typical commercial station. These are uh, put into larger tanks, obviously more um, wastewater coming into the tank and much more flow. And in this type of an application, you're gonna have a, what they call a duplex station. You'll have one pump that will run uh, and will work, and the, the station is designed to work on one pump, but then you will also have a spare pump in case there is a, a need for maintenance. Uh, the one pump will be still in the station to continue working as one pump is pulled for routine maintenance. These type of stations uh, are designed with a control panel that will alternate between the two pumps. Uh, this way you're getting equal usage on each of the pump. Typically when you get into the larger grinder stations like this, you're working with a rail system and a, a, a larger panel that will have the alternating capabilities. Operating cost. A typical residential application, the operating cost is going to be less than $3 a month for the use. The pump does not run continuously. The pump uh, runs typically eight to 10 times a day. The basin will fill up as the homeowner uses water in the home and then the pump turns on to pump down the basin and then allow it to be pumped into the lateral line. Okay, so that's a general overview of what the system is made up of. And now I'm going to turn it over to our friend uh, from Australia, Steve Wallace, and you can take over here and he's going to go into a little bit of a uh, deeper dive into what it means to design the system. Thanks for that, uh, Walt. As Walt said, my name is Steve Wallace. I work for a company called Pressure Sewer Solutions out of uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, our reason for being is, is very simple. We work with our clients to deliver pressure sewage solutions. Um, I guess my bit about my background, uh, my whole working life, I've always been involved in the design and the construction and operation of hydraulic systems. Uh, back in the late 90s, I started working with pressure sewage uh, systems and one of the first questions that occurred to me is, what's the correct delivery model? How do, you, how do you actually implement a pressure sewage system? How do you design it? How do you tender it or bid it, as you say here? Um, how do you construct it? And, uh, and what do you do to, to operate a pressure sewage system? And so really what I was looking for was to understand the whole vertical delivery stream of these type of systems. So today we're going to have a talk about uh, 
the design considerations, sort of things we look at from a design point of view, um, more in line with the, the thought process that we went through to, to understand how systems work. Um, we're going to have a look at uh, some power outages, some, some wet weather flow issues, and uh, just some di diurnal flow patterns that we've seen, we've seen with existing systems that we have. Now let's, let's launch uh, straight into the design considerations. Now, a lot of things I'm going to say here, uh, people listening are going to uh, think that, well, that's, that that's consistent with any other project that, uh, that I've ever done, and that's absolutely right. What we generally look at with a pressure sewage system is uh, we try to work hard to, to keep it simple. Pressure sewage system design isn't hard, it's just a bit different, and there's some different considerations uh, that go along with the design of a pressurised sewage system. So the first thing we look at when we're, um, we're developing a design is basically the master plan. We want to understand the uh, number of existing lots, the ultimate number of lots. Uh, if there's any future development areas, we want to understand the scheme boundaries. We start to, uh, at that stage, sketch out some lines to, um, to just, get our, just start getting our minds around the system. With any, with any design, whether it be pressure sewage system or not, you start with the big picture and then work into the detail. So we also look at the, the type of dwellings, the type of houses. An example here is a, a vacation house. So we, we, we've undertaken a lot of projects that uh, are holiday uh, towns or vacation uh, towns. And obviously the wastewater discharge profile from these type of developments will be very different to what you would see if you were providing a pressure sewage system for a rural village or, in fact, for, um, for a suburb, a, uh, an urban suburb. Also, we want to have a look and understand what sort of uh, non-residential flows there may be, what sort of commercial properties uh, that may be discharging point loads into our system. A common one, just harping back to the vacation town, would be hotels and motels, those sort of things. Now, if we've got a 50-room hotel, obviously the wastewater discharge from that sort of uh, property is going to be a lot larger than if we've got a single residential house, of course. So understanding those, those point loads and including those into the master plan is, uh, is clearly very important. Uh, storm allowances, we've, I don't know how prevalent it is here in the United States, but, but in Australia the uh, allowance for, uh, for wet weather flows or a storm allowance or inflow and infiltration is increasing in importance with the quality of the sewage treatment. I've got some slides on that later, so I'll talk a bit more about that uh, later. Next thing we, we start to do is, uh, is look at the flow rate. So once we've got our arms around the scheme boundaries and, and everything that's contained within it, we, have, we start to have a look at how we're going to determine what the, the flows are. Um, what are going to be the peak instantaneous flows? So we have a look at it from the point of view of we've got the ultimate number of properties, the maximum number of properties, uh, and point loads, what's the, what's the maximum flow that, uh, that we're going to get? And um, we establish that as our peak instantaneous flow. But we also look at the other end of the scheme. We're trying to put our, our bookends around the design parameters. We look at the other end of the scheme at uh, what those, those flows or what the flows are going to be seen on an average day. And um, it's, it's interesting when you look at the absolute peak flows and then the average day sort of peak flows and design a system that will work between those bookends. Um, it's, it's sometimes a challenge to make a system work between their bookends, but in the real world, that's how a, how a system works. One of the other things we consider with existing villages um, and even development sites is the, uh, the wastewater flow from each individual property. I know back in the Albany study uh, it was, um, it was uh, measured as being 200 gallons a day or 757 litres per property per day. But a number of the projects that, uh, that we've done have, have shown that those flow rates or well, those wastewater volumes are a little uh, less than that. So I'll continue to move through the design parameters um, that, we, that we look at. We want to, we want to now come to grips with uh, how we're going to uh, design or how we're going to calculate the, the peak flows and what hydraulic anal analysis methodology that uh, we're going to use. We, we actually uh, we use a, hy a hydraulic grade line um, modelling tool, which seems to work for us uh, quite, quite well. We use uh, Colbert White uh, formulas, but I know in the United States you use a lot of uh, Hayes and Williams formulas with a C factor of somewhere between 120 and 150. And given that there's uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of systems uh, around the United States using those sort of parameters, then uh, there's, there's no real reason to, to change that. Once we've sketched out the design in the master plan, as I said, we, we start looking at 
where the pipes are located, um, which sections of the main are pumping downhill, pumping uphill, uh, which sections we may have creek crossings or highway crossings, river, river crossings, railway crossings, those, those sort of things. What we're looking for is, is anything that, uh, that may cause us to increase our hydraulic loadings. So downhill pumping is, is an important um, consideration. You may have a creek crossing where we would often actually use a smaller pipe size uh, on, a, on a creek crossing to increase the velocities uh, and, and make sure that um, that low point is, is scoured clean on a daily basis. In terms of downhill pumping, the other issue that we uh, need to consider is, is the management of the air. Clearly the air is going to be entrapped within the pipe and it's going to generate uh, a buoyancy and the way to, to manage that is a few things you can do. You can actually use the wastewater volume to scour that through the system, to scour the air through the system. Um, you can release the air out of the system via air valves. If you do that, you've got to consider that uh, the discharge may be odorous. Normally very small quantities of air, so we don't normally have a problem with, with odour at, uh, at air valves, but certainly it's a consideration. Other thing we do is um, we just use additional pump head to, uh, to push against the, the buoyancy to overcome the air that's in the line. Look, there's lots of systems around where this, this has been done and it's, uh, it's, it's nothing new, but it's certainly a consideration. Also in terms of uh, the pipe lake location, we want to look at the static heads. We want to look at the, the, uh, the, the height of the hill we're pumping over, I, I guess, um, and couple that with the, uh, the friction losses allows us to determine the, the hydraulic grade line. So once we've got an understanding of the, the total flows that the system is going to generate, we, uh, we look at the downstream capacity. So the downstream infrastructure capacity, uh, does it have the uh, enough capacity to discharge the wastewater on a, on a peak day scenario, but also does it have the capacity to, uh, to, dis to, to accept a high volume uh, occasion like a power, a power outage flow? I'll explain what that is when I've got a chart further on that uh, goes into a bit of detail with that, so we'll talk about that a little later. Clearly, wastewater, wastewater uh, velocities within the pipe system is a, is a key parameter. You've got the, the pressure the, the pump will see at one end of the spectrum, and you've got velocities. They're, they're your two key um, parameters. And we generally look at the, the total, the maximum flows within the system, and we look at the pressure at that time, we look at the minimum flows within the system, and we look at the velocities uh, at, uh, at the low end of the bookend. So if we can design a system between those two bookends, high flows and uh, at, at the, the largest number of properties that we've got, and satisfactory velocities at the smallest flow we can predict, then we know the system is going to work uh, within the range between those two parameters. Of course we need to look at and, uh, and take into consideration the the performance parameters that the manufacturers recommend uh, their pump to, uh, to give. Okay, other design considerations that, uh, that we look at are, are more site related. Okay, we'll have a look at um, environmental, cultural, geotechnical type issues. Environmental is a classic, we get flora and fauna that may be in a sensitive area, and uh, this, once you understand where those areas are, obviously it's a modification of the master plan, <coughs> or it could simply be that uh, those sections of the site need to be directionally drilled, so we're not, we're not disturbing the, uh, the flora or the, or the fauna. Cultural issues, we, uh, we often find that uh, we need to be very sensitive of, of cultural issues, uh, local indigenous people within the area, uh, and um, that's one of the beauties of a pressure sewerage system with the robustness of the pump and the flexibility that uh, that allows within the design. We can often avoid those areas where traditional gravity systems would have to just plough straight through some of those areas. Um, so it, it, uh, the pressure sewer really does facilitate uh, taking these issues into account. Geotechnical issues within a project is, is also very important. We, we've done quite a number of projects uh, that have, have uh, sensitive ground conditions such as landslip, um, and with the polyethylene pipe, the flexible, fully welded polyethylene pipe that we generally use in our systems, it, uh, it's, it's, if the ground moves, then we know we're not necessarily going to be shearing, shearing the pipe. Um, with a gravity system, uh, PVC pipe, concrete manholes, then any ground movement can, can be a disaster and certainly um, lead to uh, an environmental spill of sewerage. It could, the geotechnical issues could be very, very simple. It could be rock. It could be ground, uh, uh, high water table in the ground. 
or it could be marshy, swampy sort of conditions. So you just need to consider all, all those sort of things in the, in the design. When we set out the mains, we often come across uh, a situation where we have a preferable location for a main to run through private property. So there could be titling and easement issues uh, that we need to think about. Future main extensions to uh, future sewer areas, we need to set those out and know that they can, they can work. And uh, we also look at, from a site perspective, the quality of the electrical supply. We, we had a project uh, once that, that had a single high voltage feed into the village. And uh, cut a long story short, basically what happened was that we had uh, one phase go down and um, happened right at the, the peak operating time. And the pumps that were on that phase just uh, burnt out the, uh, the contactors. So we lost quite a number of pumps. And the solution to it is very simple. Once you know that you, you may get low voltage in, in that area, uh, it's, it's, just a, um, it's just a relay, a low voltage relay that's, that switches off the pump and protects it. It's a very in, inexpensive uh, protection against the pump, and, and in fact, I think most of the products now have that as a uh, as a standard. But it's uh, it's worth knowing. It's one of the the traps that we fell into uh, quite a few years ago. On on each property, we generally undertake uh, the property design as well. So we have an existing town. We'll send we'll send uh, one of our design people to the to the town, and uh, to meet with every property owner. Now. This is, a, this is the, the most important component of engaging the community into the project. Meet with a, you meet with the property owner, um, you talk to the property owner about where the pressure sewer equipment is going to go, where the pump unit is going to go, where the panel is going to go, where the valves are, where the discharge pipe are uh, going to be located or where it's best to be located and negotiate those locations within reasons with each of the property owners. Uh, and then we, uh, we also talk to each of the property owners about how the system is going to work what they've got to pay for, what they don't have to pay for, what the utility, the water authority or council is uh, is paying for, and how the whole system is is going to actually be installed in the program. And really, what that what that does, it uh, it, it engages the community. It, it it gains a progressive commitment of the community to the system. And we've we've found that the best projects that we've been involved with have have always engaged the community very very well. While we're on site, we also have a look at the, the condition of the existing plumbing system on the property and the electrical system. Clearly with the plumbing system we want to be sure that uh, it complies generally with codes. We sometimes uh, video, do or use a pipe camera, but mostly it's just a visual inspection uh, and, and other times. Uh, we also want to have a look at the electrical system. We need to be sure that the electrical system is safe for us to send our contractors to, to work on. Okay, so we then have a look at um, we want to understand on each property the sort of build-out rate of the property and whether it's going to be a slow build-out. If that's the case, then obviously we need to, to put some commissioning and operation plans in place so we're not going to, so the system's going to perform. We often have uh, swimming pools back home, um, and the only issue we find with swimming pools is that um, a swimming pool pump in backwash mode often is a high-flow, low-head pump. and a, precious, a pump unit, a pressure sewer unit, is the opposite. It's a higher head, low flow pump the majority of times. And so what we don't want to happen is that a swimming pool pump uh, discharge into a pressure sewer tank and um, we get a surcharge because it overloads the tank. So very simplistically what we do is, is uh, where a property has a swimming pool, we'll discharge the, the backwash into uh, just a buffer tank. It may just be a thousand, um, a thousand litres, you know, two, two hundred. No, what would that be? Two hundred and fifty gallon tank, and uh, the swimming pool pump discharge into that tank, and then we just regulate the discharge from that tank to the pressure sewer unit at a rate the pressure sewer unit can pump out. It's fairly, uh, it's fairly straightforward. Another issue. This is a pet hate of mine. Is uh, is trade waste issues. Um, you might think of them more as uh, uh, the sort of waste that we get from food shops and grease resters. I'll talk a little about that uh, that later. I've got a slide. I hope that is having lunch at the moment. Okay. The couple of other issues that we consider, and then we'll have a have a look at uh, how some systems perform. We want to understand a bit about how the project is going to be constructed. A lot of our projects uh, are using directional drilling technology. Not all, but a lot. And so understanding how it's going to be constructed, the type of materials that uh, we're selecting, and um, you know, commissioning plan for the system. Clearly the design needs to, uh, to consider local authority standards. We work uh, pretty much all over Australia and, uh, and some of the Pacific Islands and, and, New, and New Zealand, certainly. And each local 
authority has a different uh, a different requirement. So understanding their requirements, their cultural issues, uh, and and the sort of charges and and the policies that uh, the local authority uses to deliver the the project. Another very important thing, on par with engaging the community, is is bringing the operators of the system into the design process. Without fail, we find the operators are very resourceful people, have a have a huge amount of experience, maybe not in pressure sewer, but they know how they how they operate systems, they know um, once you explain how a pressure sewer system works, they know and they have a lot of questions, they know how they're going to want to uh, operate this system. So almost without fail, bringing the operators in, it engages them, it gets, the, gets them committed to the project and um, as I say, almost without fail, they, they add value to uh, to the process. So bringing the operators in. So look, there's a, there's a lot of issues there that I've just run through fairly quickly. But um, once again, as I said, pressure sewage design isn't hard, it's just a little different. Some of the considerations are a little different and some of them are absolutely identical to, to other systems design. So what I'm going to run through now is a little about the, the thought process that uh, back in the 90s we went through to, to try and understand pressure sewage systems. Just a point, uh, on some of these slides I've got ETs there, as on this slide at the, uh, the bottom axis I've got ETs. ET is uh, an EDU in the United States, an equivalent dwelling unit. So it's, a, it's the equivalent of a residential house, basically. When we first started looking at design of pressure sewage systems, we, we wanted to understand how to calculate the peak, peak flows. And uh, you'll see this chart in front of you that has a, a red stepped line. The red step line is, uh, is E1's probability method of, uh, of calculating, calculating, uh, calculating peak wastewater flow. Basically, it looks at the total number of properties that, uh, that are in a project and the probability of how many of those properties are going to have pump units that are going to be working, operating simultaneously. It was based on a, uh, the Albany study back in the late 60s, I believe, 40 years old, but an exceptional report. Paul Farrell and his team, from my, in my opinion, did a uh, did a great job on it. Uh, and so, this method was was grown out of that that study and some further data uh, analysis that uh, that they did. The black the black line that's, that that really does track the probability method is a is an R factor method that uh, we use in Australia. And very simple, all it is is a is a uh, an average flow to peak flow factor. So it's a peaking factor basically. Calculate the average. Um, so we calculate the volume from the uh, the area, the village, the project, and then uh, work it out how much, what the volume is. It turn that into a flow rate. So we calculate the volume, multiply, divide it by 86,400 seconds in 24 hours, and then apply the R factor formula, which just is a peaking factor. So it gives you a peak flow. Okay, that R factor there excludes wet weather flows. It is it is just peak wastewater flows. So as you can see, it correlates pretty well after about uh, you know, 200 um, lots ETs, EDUs. It correlates fairly well with the E1's probability method, which, which gave us a bit of encouragement. The thicker blue line there was the rational method. Now, I know that there's different parameters that can be input into the rational method formula, but um, this, this chart's quite old. When we did this, this was what we thought reflected our, our conditions. And interestingly, the, the rational method in the, in the uh, smaller number of properties is uh, the flows are a, are a little less than the probability method, but uh, then it sort of uh, it launches the flows into um, being quite quite high. The thinner pink line right at the top there is a common effluent pumping system um, flow methodology, which included an element of of wet weather flows. And um, the the issue we're really getting at looking at this chart was that we understood the critical nature of velocities in the system and obviously pressure. And um, temptation is always to, let's make the pipe a bit bigger, just to be sure. Well, with the pressure sewage system, that's not really a good answer because if you're calculating the, the flow to be higher than it actually is, then when the system is, is operating, the velocities are going to be lower than you really want them to be. And low velocities aren't your friend. You want the velocities to, to give you a good scouring velocity on an average day, um, and so therefore you want to get the the sort of flows, the wastewater flows calculated reasonably accurately, in, in our opinion. But what about the thought process? When, when we sort of looked at the, the different methodologies of, uh, of calculating 
the, the flows, we wanted to correlate that with, um, with some existing projects. And so there's a couple of projects here on, on the chart. You'll see there's one project there that uh, was just over 200 uh, properties, ETs, another project that was just under 400. Now, you'll see the, the pink square. Now, what that represents is from this 12 months of data of each of those projects, the, the pink square is the absolute peak flow that we achieved in that 12 months, that we saw the system achieve in that 12 months. And uh, you'll see that uh, it's a little lower than the, the probability method uh, forecasted to be. This project was actually designed on the probability method. So it's a little bit lower than that, which meant our velocities were a little lower than we really wanted them to be. But the interesting uh, thing that we found was that you'll see the, the black triangle that's below each of those pink squares. For each of the systems, that black triangle is is the uh, what we called the average daily peak. So on, on an average day, what's the peak flow going to be? And in these two systems, it was the black triangle. So it's really interesting that the, the, on the average day, the, peak, the peaks were quite a bit less than the probability method. Um, and you'll see there on the far left-hand side of the chart, there's uh, a little red Stop there. Well, that was actually the flows from the, the Albany uh, study, but it didn't really help us in this chart because the, the number of properties was just too low. So the thought, our thought from, from this, uh, what we took away from this was that, okay, the, the probability method uh, gives you a, a pretty good tracking, a pretty good profile of what the flows are going to be, but maybe it's a little high. But then we thought, well, what does the probability method do? It really doesn't consider the volume of wastewater from, from each property. Um, and when you look at most of the, the wastewater flow calculation methods, they almost all consider what the, uh, the wastewater discharge from each property is. If you look at this chart, well, this, I'm not suggesting people use this as a, as a design tool. This was our thought process, OK? So if you look at this, this chart, we said, OK, well, let's, take, let's say we had 600 litres per property per day. And if that property was discharging 400 litres per property today, 400 litres being approximately 106 gallons, then um, you're going to be getting about 17 pumps operating simultaneously. However, if that same 600 properties was discharging more like 1,000 litres per property per day, you're going to be getting something like 26, 27 um, pressure seal units operating simultaneously. And so it, it appeared to us with the data, we correlated that back to the, the previous chart we had, and it appeared to us that the, the flow rate from each individual property um, really does have an impact on the, the peak flows that, um, that we're going to see. And so let's, uh, let's now have a look at, at some projects that are uh, actually, pressure series projects that are actually operating. This is one, uh, it's only, I think it's a week, uh, what's it, yes, a, week of, a week of flow. But I put this one in from, uh, this was a model of friends from South East Water from Melbourne that should, uh, had provided for me six, seven years ago. And um, it actually shows the, a fairly good diurnal flow pattern. You can see the, flow, the peak flows in the morning are higher than the peak flows in the afternoon. Nothing different to what you would, uh, you would really expect to see, other than the peak flows were less than we'd forecast at the time. So, we thought that was uh, that was interesting. If we have a look at if we have a look at another project, um, this this was only three days, but this project in particular was a was a, a suburb. It's just a, 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 a an urban residential suburb, and so you can see the red line at the top. That's the if if we modify the calculation method based upon the peak flow calculation method based upon the discharge from each property per day, then that's what we're saying was the calculated peak. And as you can see, I know it's only three days, but it, 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 uh, it correlates reasonably well with that methodology. The absolute peaks are very peaky. They happen for short periods of time, but they're reaching that calculated peak flow pretty much spot on. Um, interestingly enough, the, the calculated average daily peak for a suburb is we actually exceed it on each of these three days. Um, but and you understand, think about how a suburb operates. Um, you know, mum and dad get up and go to work, kids go to school, everyone has a shower in the morning. The peaks are normally higher flows for shorter periods, and that's what you would, you would really expect. That was all starting to make a bit of sense for us. Um, we get a lot of projects that, that are vacation communities. 
and we sort of we, we wanted to understand a bit more about how the flows work in the vacation community. And this is an interesting uh, chart. You'll see that um, the top red line is the, the probability method, the simultaneous pump operations method of determining peak flows. The middle red line is the method that we would have generally used, um, well, without this data we would have generally used, and the, uh, the lower red line was the, the method that uh, was basically the, the average daily peak flow. And so this, this vacation community didn't, uh, didn't achieve, other than for power outage events, didn't achieve the, uh, the calculated peak flow or the simultaneous method of uh, calculating peak flow. We sort of bounced along at the average peak flow uh, for the whole period. We got close to the average flow almost, uh, almost or consistently, I guess, in, in the holiday period on the right-hand side there. But what it showed to us when we looked at uh, this data at a micro level was that that the the average flows um, that the flows from a, from a vacation community, in fact were about the same volume as the suburb, but the peaks happened over a longer period of time, uh, and therefore we didn't get the peak flows into, into the pipe. So we thought that was interesting, so we had, a, we had a look at another project, which was also a vacation community, and this was just the two months during the vacation period. And it said the same thing, really. It, the calculated averages, we were bouncing along that line, so every day we were seeing the flows uh, at the calculated average, but we really weren't seeing those peak, those peak times. Um, you may have noticed, or I made mention of those, uh, those power outage times, and there's another one on this chart here. I'll talk a bit about those later because I think they're, uh, they're kind of interesting. Just to break it up a bit, um, I, hope, uh, I hope nobody's having lunch at the moment. One of the things that we looked at, one of the things that I spoke of previously, was, uh, was, was Greece Arresta's uh, trade waste and understanding what, what happens. This is a photo of a, a small... Greece Arresta on a, it was actually a butcher shop in one of the, the rural villages that, uh, that we designed the system for. And uh, when, when one of my guys showed me this photo, I was horrified to think that that sort of grease waste uh, was going to be discharged into a special sewer unit, the pump unit. You know, when I was, when I was a kid at school, um, I used to work in a butcher shop, go, to go there after school cleaning up and help them clean up. And we'd go into the butcher shop and I'd like this this copper, which was basically like a 44-gallon drum full of water, and you'd have a little gas heater, a gas, uh, a gas burner under it. And uh, you get the, I'd get the water to boiling point, and then I'd go and clean the sausage machine and clean the, the mince meat making machine, um, and uh, wash, we'd uh, then wash the refrigeration display cabinets and the chopping boards. And the last thing I would do was get all the, uh, all the grease and the fats off the floors, and we'd flush it down the floor, the, the drain and uh, then never thought about it anymore because it was gone down the drain. What happens, uh, that, and that's exactly what happens in, in uh, this type of food shop, and if we don't, it doesn't matter what sort of sewage system it is, if we don't uh, treat grease waste, if we don't remove the solids, we don't remove the fats, uh, we, don't, we don't cool the temperature of the wastewater down, that goes into a gravity sewage system, a vacuum sewage system, or a pressure sewage system, then it's going to shorten the life and it's going to cause problems within that system. So, so understanding trade waste issues and understanding what sort of pretreatments required is, is important, um, no matter what sort of sewage system, and pressure sewage is, is no different to that. The other sort of shops that we find that we, we pay particular attention to nowadays are, uh, are bakeries. So we seem to uh, have learnt the, uh, the lesson to, to make sure we have pretreatment on wastewater from, uh, from bakeries. Okay, the the other thing we're finding back home is that there's a, an increasing importance placed on eliminating inflow and infiltration, um, a storm allowance, uh, rainfall getting into the sewerage system, um, or I and I as we call it back home. So in a pressure sewage system, I guess I raise the question: um, Does it does it happen, and, and how do you uh, how do you manage it in a pressure sewage system? Well, what we've what we found is that the reason that there's a there's an increasing need to remove INI from a pressure sewage system is that the communities are absolutely demanding higher quality treatment. They want wastewater treated to a higher quality. They don't want to be discharging to the environment. They want to reuse the water. To reuse the, uh, the effluent from a sewage treatment plant, uh, it's, it's imperative that you, uh, 
to the highest level, so it can even be used on houses. It can be used for, uh, for aerated sprinklers um, sprayed in the air. So to do that, we've really got to remove those huge peaks that sewage treatment plants see when there's wet weather events. You know, I'm, we're doing a project at the moment in, uh, in New Zealand, actually, that um, was installed as a gravity sewage system uh, 15, 17 years ago. And it's now being replaced with a pressure sewage system because every time it rains down there, and guess what, it rains a lot in New Zealand, it uh, well, certainly rains a lot every time I go there, um, it's, um, the wastewater, the, the rainwater gets into the sewage system and it surcharges at the sewage treatment plant to the environment, to the local river. And so the community is saying, look, that's enough. It's just not acceptable anymore. You, you can't discharge the environment with, with, uh, with untreated sewage. So does it happen? Does wet flows happen in pressure sewage system? This was a project. We had 12 months of, of data, the, uh, the chart on your screen. What we did was um, we took that, that flow data. We extracted out the wet weather days. We then plotted the maximum flows, minimum flows, and, and average flows, um, indicated here by the blue, green, and, uh, and the brownie red line through the middle. And then we overlaid the wet weather days um, in those coloured lines. So that really indicates that on this project, we were pretty happy that it was performing on wet weather, during wet weather events, that we weren't getting higher flow rates than we were getting during normal operation. We did this for seven days a week, but this chart here is just obviously an example. We also looked at, uh, at the volumes to the sewage treatment plant as well. And we did the same exercise for the volumes and got exactly the same results. Um, so we know that the pressure sewage system can eliminate wet weather flows. We had a look at another project. This was a, a Sydney water project, uh, actually. And um, you'll see here just seven days of data. The last uh, couple of days were, were wet weather. You'll see the... The pink lines are, are in fact the uh, normal diurnal pro profile that you'd see for wastewater discharge from, a, uh, from residential properties. And you'll see that thinner black or blue line, which is actually the cumulative total of the rainfall. And as you can see, the, the system performed on the wet days the same as it really did on, on the dry days. So we were pretty happy that we can make a, a pressure sewage system uh, eliminate wet weather flows given that we've got fully welded polyethylene pipe in the streets, we've got the pressure sewer unit close to the house, so we haven't got long, deep house sewers. Um, so that leaves the other dimension of what happens on, you've still got the house sewer, and um, there's still the potential for gutters um, or groundwater or uh, surface water getting into gullies, into the house sewer, which then goes into the pressure sewer unit. This is another project, I designed this project, and um, we had a major storm about six months after the project was commissioned, and this was the results that we got. We got, we got about three times the volume to the sewage treatment plant on that day of heavy rainfall, uh, February the 12th, 2007. And obviously the client was very concerned. This was a high-quality sewage treatment plant. The, the, uh, the effluent was being reused, spray irrigated onto, a, onto a showgrounds. Um, the whole, the whole reason that pressure sewer had been used on these projects was because we could eliminate the the wet weather flows. So this was a real concern. So to cut a long story short, the, the problem was a very, very small number of pressure sewer units. Out of the 220 pressure sewer units, we had a problem with around 15 or 16 of them. We had about 12 of the pressure sewer units where the, the, the previous grey water line from laundries, laundry water, washing machine, wastewater, um, used to go to a, an absorption trench in the ground, didn't go to the septic tank. Okay? or it would go to a table drain or a, or a dish drain into the stormwater system. Because it was going into the ground, then it was common practice to connect the, uh, the gutter downpipes to that same pipe. And um, when the plumbers connected that grey water line to the pressure sewer unit, they didn't disconnect the, uh, the downpipe, the gutter line. So we had, we had roof water going into the uh, pressure sewer units on about uh, 11 or 12 of those pressure sewer units. So we fixed that, and uh, the other small issue was that when the rainfall was that heavy, there were some overland flow paths that, that nobody knew about at the design stage, and uh, we had a bit of inundation uh, of groundwater into the top of the pressure sewer unit. So we sealed those ones off, we disconnected the downpipes, and the problem went away. The point is that inflow and infiltration can happen in a pressure sewer system, 
but it can be managed and it can be eliminated because there's plenty of projects around where, where it has been eliminated. Another thing that uh, we like to look at during the design phase of a project is, is what happens uh, after a power outage. Um, clearly, people still discharge wastewater into the pressure sewer unit, the pump unit. Wastewater level in the pump unit uh, rises above the on level of the pump because of that power, the pump doesn't go on. And uh, when the power does come back on, then a, number, a, a large number of the uh, pump units all try to start at the, the same time. So what results? Well, what results is that you'll suddenly get a high flow. This chart on the screen now, it shows seven days, I think, of, uh, of performance of the pressure sewer, of the, uh, of the village is pressure sewer system. And you'll see the diurnal patterns are fairly consistent with what we saw earlier until we get the, the power outage. And then we had this peak flow of 18 litres a second for a, a relatively short period of time until the, the system pumped down. Now, while you're getting that peak flow, the, the pumps will be protected because all the pump vendors now have, uh, have safeguards against, uh, against overload from, from those sort of high flows and high pressure situations. But the, the key thing you need to consider is that um, if you've got a number of the pump units three quarters full, full, half full of, of wastewater, they all start at the same time, we're going to have a high flow to the downstream connection point, but we're also going to have quite a significant volume going to be pumped out in a short period of time. If you have a look at the chart that's on, that's on the screen here, you'll see that the power went off here at about, well, based on the flow, the power went off at about 5 a.m. in the morning and returned at uh, about 8 a.m. in the morning. And so it started to go into the peak time, and then when the power came back on, you'll see it bounced straight up to about 18 litres uh, a second and took an hour to recover. So while we had a high flow at the discharge point, we also had quite a high volume at the discharge point. So the, the, the issue here is uh, when designing a pressure sewer system, make sure that the, the downstream infrastructure has the capacity to take that volume and that flow. And if it doesn't, then it's, it's not the end of the world. There's, there's other methods you can, uh, you can design into the system to reduce that flow to the downstream infrastructure. Another thing we look at is, is air management. We touched on air management uh, in the introduction. Um, air gets in and gets trapped in the system. could be at a high point in, in the system, uh, but it will be in there. And so that can generate a buoyancy head. What do you do about that? Uh, you move the air by, you either move the air through the system by using the pump pressure to overcome the buoyancy, or you use the velocity um, of the, the wastewater moving through the system, or you expel the air via, uh, via an air valve. Here's a, here's a chart that uh, we've, we've, tried, we've read a lot of reports on air movement in, uh, in systems. Most of these reports have been done more around water systems than sewage systems, and I certainly haven't read any that are specific to pressure sewage systems. However, this was a chart that uh, was put together by the Wallingford Institute out of the UK, and um, it was a, uh, an air movement in pipe, uh, pipes report, water pipe, water pipe report, and it, it does actually show the sort of velocities that uh, their studies have have concluded the velocities that are required to move air downhill. So, um, as you can see, it's starting at about 0.6 metres a second or, or two foot a second uh, in Imperial. And as the, as the grade of the downward sloping pipe increases, then the velocity needs to increase. You need to keep in mind in a pressure sewerage system that the flow parameters vary enormously. So you can't just design that velocity at that peak flow because you don't get that peak flow for a long enough period in any given day and therefore you don't have for a long enough period, you won't have it uh, enough to flush the air through the system. So when we use, we use velocities to move air, we, we, we don't use the peak flow, we, we might use something a little less than the average daily flow. So sometimes we'll actually reduce the pipe size to, to generate that higher velocity. Um, but certainly I think uh, there needs to be a bit more work on, uh, on the general engineering fraternity understanding how air interacts in the system. Odour is another system, look, another issue to, to consider. There's thousands of systems in place where odour uh, doesn't, become a, doesn't become a problem. However, with any sewage system that's designed, odour is a design parameter that, uh, that needs to be considered. So while the sewage is in the pipe, while the wastewater is in the pipe, you don't have a problem. When, when it's released, uh, when the pressure lines discharge the atmosphere, whether it be air release, liquid phase or gas phase, then you may have an odour issue, you, may, or you also may have a, uh, a, a corrosion issue to the downstream infrastructure. Not any different to any other sewage system. So what we do with, to, try and, to, to manage odour is that 
we, uh, we designed the system with, with short retention times, as short as possible, but given that uh, the wastewater is going to still stay in the pipe overnight, you can't really avoid the, um, the fact that uh, you, you may well get longer retention times overnight. So, but, but we still try and design the system to reduce that retention time. We look at discharging the, uh, the wastewater to a location where, if there is odour, it won't be uh, detectable or offensive to, to anybody. Often we'll have a client say, look, connect it to this gravity manhole. But a couple hundred yards down the road, we may have a sewage pumping station that, uh, that we could connect to that may have a buffer zone around it, so it doesn't have, doesn't have a houses immediately around it. It may have odour control at the sewage pumping station. So by choice, we would connect to the sewage pumping station rather than the, uh, the gravity access chamber. Sometimes we put chemical dosing uh, iron salts, uh, we dose into the system, proportionally dose into the system. Um, we sometimes will uh, we'll scrub air release just with carbon canisters we've had a bit of success with, or sometimes we just release it at a high level vent. Um, Got to be careful with the high level vent. Sometimes in very still days, the H2S is heavier than air, so it can still sort of waft back down to the ground. We, on occasions, we've flushed uh, fresh water into the main just in small quantities just to sort of keep it going. Normally, we've done that on a development site if, it's a, if, it's a, if we have a long build-out. And, of course, we uh, will select non-corrosive construction materials uh, if, at all, if at all possible. And we often will um, protect downstream concrete structures by simply epoxy coating them. So, odour control facilities. This is a ferric chloride uh, dosing system or iron salts dosing system, a little larger than we normally have, we normally see in our, our systems. The normal type of dose, chemical dosing system that we'll have is a small one like this. It's a uh, you know, 120 gallon unit that uh, proportionally doses uh, chemical into the line. It's fairly inexpensive and um, it seems to do the, job, uh, do the job well. Often we'll just have a, an air valve. If it's at a critical location, we'll have a, uh, the, the, the stainless steel cylinder there is an air valve and we'll have a Kalman canister sitting on top of that, just to scrub the air. So, wrapping that up, what I've tried to take through today is just some of the thought processes that, that, uh, that we've gone through in designing systems. I haven't had the opportunity to, to spend, uh, to go to the A to Z of, of pressure series systems, but just tried to, uh, to get you to think about how to do it. So look at the wastewater flows, look at the type of projects that it is, the, whether it's a, an urban residential project or it's a vacation community, the flow parameters are different. What are you going to do about storm allowance and what management practices are going to be in place and design practices are going to be in place to eliminate it? Uh, does the downstream infrastructure have the capacity for the power outage flows and the, and the volumes? How are you going to manage air in the systems? And of course, uh, trade waste treatment from each individual lot. So thank you for your time. I, uh, I think we're, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Well, thank you, Stephen Walt, for your presentations. We have George Vorsheim from E1 to field questions for Stephen Walt. Thanks, Dennis. And we have a lot of good questions today, and we'll try to zip through as many as possible. Uh, if your question isn't answered in, uh, in our time block that we have today, uh, we'll answer that individually later. Uh, first question. Are the pressure sewer designs set up as step systems? Uh, Steve, do you want to handle that? One? Yeah, Steve Wallace. Um, generally, generally, no. We've we've actually replaced quite a few step systems, uh, interestingly. But we find that um, clients that have have analysed the the different sewerage solutions for uh, for projects and looked at step systems compared to pressure sewage systems, they've often come, they've, well, almost always uh, gone with a pressure sewage system simply because it eliminates the, the septic tank. So you haven't got the solids on, on the individual properties. Um, one of the things uh, our clients have considered is, well, look, there's an existing septic tank. tank. We can put in a vault with a, uh, a multi-staged uh, pump in there and turn it into a step system. But, but still, you go to the property and you'll find that the septic tanks are old, and quite a number of them are going to be replaced. Uh, if that asset's going to be owned by the Water Authority, can you take the chance on, on having failing concrete structures? So then you make the decision of replacing those septic tanks. And so from a cost point of view, pressure sewerage uh, is generally uh, on par or, or, or if not better than step systems. And, and we found that, um, that over the long term they, they seem to perform better also. And sure. I think I would just I would add to that also um, it, in a pressure design, when utilizing grinder pumps, it's best to keep the tank size in a smaller diameter, and this this keeps you from the septic. It keeps you the the pH levels in the tank. 
the acidity level will be down and it's much uh, easier on the equipment that's used. Okay, very good. Uh, what design software is out there for uh, design of these systems? Well, there's several available, but I, I would like to mention that uh, we have Design Assistant 8 available as a free download on the E1 website, and that uh, is, is a standard used throughout the United States, and it um, will install and work on any type of Windows-based system. Here's a question regarding air relief valves. When are air relief valves most commonly used, just at high points or every so many feet? <laughs> Typically in high points. I mean, Steve, you might want to chime in on that also. Sure. Uh, at, at, at high points, we've we've used them in the past on on, it, uh, on, on long rising mains. If we we've got mains that have that might travel some miles before we get to a connection point, and we may go uh, under a number of creeks and things like that. Um, what will happen with air in that situation? It's a flat site, and then there's there's local inverted siphons under creeks or railway lines and, and such like then the, the air in the system will, will elongate. Um, and, and often in that situation, you're not going past residential properties. And so having an air valve um, releasing uh, a small amount of air every day uh, isn't really a problem. If we, We've tried to, uh, in the past on projects uh, where air where air has become a, an issue, a real issue to, to, uh, to consider. We've tried to, to model the amount of air, the quantity of air, the volume of air, I guess, um, to be released from the air valve, from a pressure series system. And it's generally very, very small, and we, uh, we really couldn't model it because the volume was too small. We generally, there's, there's, there's three key things you need to remember about air valves. Firstly, that they're expensive. Um, secondly, that, they, um, that they, they require maintenance. And um, thirdly, that on occasions they'll leak. So our philosophy is to try and eliminate, the, eliminate air valves in the system wherever possible. On occasions, you have high points um, where, where you just can't avoid them. In, in fact, actually, in most occasions, we don't actually put them right at the high point. We put them just downstream of the high point because if you look at how the air moves, the, the wastewater volume um, will, then, will then push the air up keeping in mind that the density of the air is obviously less than, uh, than the water, and the air bubble will push downstream at that high point. If you have the air valve at the absolute high point, then the, 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 the wastewater in the pipe covers the, or submerges the, the air valve inlet. So you want the air valve actually to be just downstream of the high point. Okay, that's fascinating. Here's a multiple question. What is an average cost of modifying the existing sewer system per residential household how long does it take to install the new pressure sewer lateral, lateral, and how do we handle community involvement for a big city? Oh, well, that's <laughs> that's a three-part question, and all uh, uh, each one of those uh, you could spend a lot of time on the answers. But uh, from the standpoint of, of let's start with the community. Uh, you know, basically, you will have uh, some type of a town meeting. Uh, you want to educate the homeowners, the future. Um, owners of the pressure sewer system, and you want to be able to have experts there to help answer that. So typically, you're going to have the engineer involved with the project, and um, you would also want to have the manufacturer there and, and, any, and anyone else that would be involved with the install. From the standpoint of, of retrofitting, you know, typically, uh, you're going to be abating the, the septic, and, and that is, uh, you know, obviously, you've got to get the tank out of there, or in some cases, it can be, you know, drained out and filled. Uh, the install of, of the 24-inch diameter tank is fairly easy on the existing infrastructure and environment. I mean, in a lot of cases, an auger is used, and, and uh, you can get away from the, uh, the traditional back hole, auger the, the hole in, and, and lower the, the system in. And, of course, as, a, as we saw earlier in the presentation, depending on your frost line, if you have a, um, a shallow uh, dig, uh, you can actually use a standard ditch switch to run that line out through the home. Okay. Uh, if there is build-out in the utility district, how is that accommodated? Uh, from the standpoint of uh, adding on to an existing pressure sewer system, um, um, from the design standpoint, and I believe Steve did a pretty good job of mentioning this earlier, but you want to uh, avoid, uh, let's make the pipe a little bit bigger, but also you want to be able to make sure that you design in such a way that you can allow for build-out. Uh, we've had some situations where we knew there was going to be a slow build-out where we would actually run two diameter pipes through the force main. Uh, so we knew that maybe five, ten years they would be on the smaller pipe, and then as the build-out build came along, then 
they would switch over to the larger pipe in the system. Okay. So that's a rare that's a rare situation. We've got about 60 seconds. Uh, how many homes do you recommend on one pressure sewer line before utilizing a pump station or discharge to a gravity sewer? There's no limit. Okay. Good answer. It's, it's all it's all it's all about it's just a function of the the, the hydraulics and the uh, the way the community or the water authority want to operate the system. There's no hydraulic limit to, to do that um, other than the head of the pump, really, and the velocities. Okay. Uh, one last question. Who is responsible for maintaining the grinder pumps? Uh, here in the States, it, it, it's a bit of a, a mixed bag. We, uh, in a lot of cases, the municipality will take over the ownership of the complete system. And um, that as part of the utility bill for the homeowner, uh, the municipality is uh, operating and maintaining that system. There's also areas where there may be a private utility district that comes in and, and maintains it. We also have uh, distributors that may have a service contract that will work with the existing municipality. And in some cases, the, the homeowner actually owns it. Somewhat like your hot water tank in your home, you also own your pressure sewer system. Everything uh, in the tank up to the line is yours, and then, of course, the line is, is maintained and operated somewhat like a gravity by the municipality. And one last question. Uh, there's more that we'll answer offline, but uh, uh, Charles Halsey asked, does Steve have a pet koala bear? <laughs> no, 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 the, the, uh, the shark ate him. <laughs> the shark. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dennis, back to you. Okay, thank you, George. Uh, this concludes today's webcast. On behalf of E1 and Water and Waste Digest, I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar. All questions that did not get answered today will be responded by the E1 team. This webinar will be archived on www.mag.com for your convenience. Please utilize the E1 contact information on your screen for additional questions and follow-up. Thank you, and have a good day.